Tonight on SIP episode 84, we conclude our section on the Rhone Valley in the Northern Rhone with this special place behind me, Hermitage. And we have two of Cellar Angel's favorites, Steve Law with McLaren Wines and Jeff Loomis with Loomis. They are dedicated only to Rhone varietals, one in Sonoma, the other in Napa. You are in for a delightful evening. Sit back and enjoy this ride. It gets off the rails quick. Cheers. So welcome to SIP episode 84, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 84th time we've convened virtually to discuss some of the best wines coming out of America. And this week's SIP education series focuses on the Northern Rhone and specifically a region or appellation in the Northern Rhone, Hermitage. And it is a special, special place to which I have not been, but our two guests have. And many of the people here, Eric, Hans, Jan, Jeff, I know, and Jane, Jim, Jim B is a new name, but there's another Jim with a brew in his name that is not new. Many people are drinking the wines that these two gentlemen make because they have purchased in advance a sip kit. So the sip kit is on the Cellar Angels website and all you need to do is go to cellarangels.com and you will see the kit there available for purchase. It will have four wines in it for the next four weeks. So that gets sent to you and you kick back in your household relax, chill with the people that made the wine and learn why it's special, where it comes from. And really, most importantly, you help support the small business wineries that we love supporting and have supported since 2010. Two of those individuals are with us this evening, and it gives me an unbelievable amount of pleasure to reintroduce to you these two gentlemen because they're great friends of Cellar Angels and just absolute credit to the industry. So without further ado, let me introduce Steve Law from McLaren Wines and Jeff Loomis from Loomis Wines. Steve and Jeff, hello, gentlemen. Hola, how's it going? It's going wonderful. Great. Uh, we are excited to have you here, and we're going to get a lot of Hermitage discussion, Hermitage, and both of you have had and been influenced by this region. And why don't we start, Steve, with you and, and your first exposure to the Rhone region and why it touched you so severely, so positively, so deeply? <laughs> All three. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes, I lived, uh, I, was, I lived in France uh, for 10 years and I was living in the Northern Rhone for five years. And so I got to travel I was very fortunate and able to travel throughout the Northern Rhone. It became my favorite region in France, um, just because uh, I loved the wines, obviously. I loved the, the, uh, the, the whites that you get from up there, the, the Viognes, the Roussins, the Marsans, but I really fell in love with Syrah, and that was my, uh, that was my thing. And so um, when I was actually working down there, I wasn't working in the wine industry. I was working in tech at the time, but I would save up my vacation hours from HP. I was working for HP at the time. I would save up my vacation hours every year and I got friends with a couple of winemakers in the Rhone Valley and I used to get my hands purple every uh, every harvest. <laughs> that was the way I used up my uh, harvest, my uh, my vacation hours from HP. So it was kind of fun. And I fell in love with Syrah. For me, it's Syrah, it, and it, it's the quintessential food wine. And I'm a foodie. I love food. And I, I think Syrah can pair with anything. And it really depends. It's the desert island wine. If you were going to get stranded on a desert island and you didn't know what fauna or flora you're going to have to slaughter to survive you could take along a bottle of syrah and you'd survive fine <laughs> for, at yeah, least a, for at least a couple hours and, and i like <laughs> I, I like that it's uh it is a very very food friendly wine and you're right when you're living there uh, it's hard not to be impacted and touched i, I love the the requirements and regulatory items that go into specifically the Northern Rhone and Hermitage, and we'll get into more into that. Jeff, you have the quintessential, I've heard it a dozen times, everybody tells this story about how they got introduced to Rhone wines. It almost sounds fabricated if I didn't know you personally and know right. that it was true. So tell people a little bit about how you uh, fell in love with the region. Sure, <clears throat> I was going to college uh, at the Harvard of the West Coast, University of Oregon, and um, ended up on a study abroad program in Avignon. And I had been drinking the prerequisite college wines, Blue Nun, Matus, Mad Dog, all the big ones, uh, some Chianti in a basket, Asti Spumanti, all, all the, the big names, all the amazing wines of the world. 
and uh, ended up in Avignon and rode my bike to school one day from a little village in Montfave I was doing and decided I'm going to take a left today and maybe skip school and ended up in this little village called Chateau Neuf de Pop where for a few francs I bought a jug of wine and had my first real wine experience and it really left an impression upon me. And do you remember, uh, was it like a store? Was it just a sidewalk vendor? Was it? It was like a little, it was like a little, uh, little store. And it was literally a white jug that chlorine comes in is what it looked like. It was, you know, a white plastic jug. And I think it was three francs or two francs. This is before the Euro. Uh, and thankfully they've come a long way in marketing and packaging. Because, yes, they uh, have. <laughs> yes, they have. It was just, you know, it was a vin de table that somebody had probably made in their backyard and were selling in a store, but it was still beautiful wine to me compared to what I was having before, for sure. Absolutely. And it's interesting because, so you were what, 22, 23? 20. Yeah. 20. Yeah. 20. Okay. Uh, I'm sure the statute of limitations have run out on, on that purchase. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Right. 20 ish. 20 ish. Yeah. And I'm and I'm interested in uh, Jim, Jeff and Sherry. Hello. How you decided when you come back stateside, have a career and you had a, a very impressive advertising career all around the Thanks. world that you decide, you know what, I'm going to make Rhone wines and I'm going to make them in the Cabernet capital of the world. Right, Napa. right. You know, again, I uh, bought the property up in Napa. It was a 60 acre hillside site, added 75 acres to it uh, after that, too. But there are a thousand wonderful cab producers in the in, in Napa Valley, and I didn't want to be the thousand and first. And I wanted to do something that I was passionate about. I wanted to try something. In the beginning, I didn't know if it was going to be great salad dressing or great wine. It was a, a complete uh, uh, quest of passion to see if something could be done. 2,000 mm -hmm. feet elevation on a hillside in the middle of an oak forest in cab country. It's not the typical uh, typical thing to do. No, I'd be curious how you were able to convince people to even come up there because where Jeff is sitting or his background is actually a shot on his property, with, which is idyllic. It's it's absolutely beautiful. It is a white knuckle ride there. I will tell oh, you yeah. that much. I've made that ride a half a dozen or more times and I've been on larger cart paths <laughs> that, that you call roads. So right. what is what is case production at Loomis? We're doing about five, six hundred now, and hope to get up to eight hundred to a thousand in the next few years. All right, and and Steve, you also took a little bit of a, you know, serendipitous route to wine country, uh, via the Rhone, and then your tech career, I think, brought you to the United States and in California. Was it working, you know, kind of in Silicon Valley area, and then taking weekend trips up to wine country, where you thought, okay, maybe I I would like to make a go of this. How, how did that? whole metamorphosis occur? Actually, I was doing that for sure. Um, I was discovering Californian wine scene, trying to understand the different appellations over here, trying to understand um, what a 16% alcohol wine tastes like, because that doesn't <laughs> exist in France. Um, so uh, it was trying to understand the different appellations over here, trying to understand the different wine scene over here. Um, but actually, the genesis for me, I guess, if I'm truly honest with my, it was actually... Um, Yves Cuiron, Francois Villard, a couple of good friends, who are the two winemakers I used to help when I was over in France. And they come over here every year. They consult with some of the wineries in, in Napa and, and down in South in um, Santa Barbara. And um, they're so good friends. So we, we always have dinner every night, every time they come over. They haven't been over for the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but um, hopefully they'll be coming over soon. But anyway, we went out to dinner in Los Gatos to a, a restaurant in Los Gatos uh, down in Ka in um, the Bay Area, and yep. we shut the we shut the place down at three o'clock in the morning, and at the end they basically said, you know, Steve, your passion's no longer tech. You need to figure out a way of getting into this business. Right. And um, and that was it. I was that, and I didn't have a clue at the time how to do it and what to do. Um, but I started very very quickly thereafter. I started the uh, the extension mm -hmm. program up at Davis, UC Davis, just to see what was going on. I had no idea why I was doing it. It was just for fun. I met a winemaker in Dry Creek through that, Michael Talty, who makes wonderful mm -hmm. Zinfandel. And I started helping Michael. Um, and so he would go up and I just would help him um, during the weekends. And uh, I would take vacation and go up and help him over harvest. And uh, in 07, I said to him, any chance I could make a little bit of Syrah on the site, since that's my absolute favorite. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. 
he doesn't have any employees either. I don't have any employees. I'm on my own. And he said to me, I'll tell you what, if you if you continue helping me make my zin, I'll let you make your surah here. And that just so happened, we both enjoyed listening to ACDC at midnight when we're doing punch downs. Perfect. So we became we became really good friends. <laughs> and that's how it started. I love it. And uh, for some of you that are just joining, uh, we're spending the evening with Steve Law of McLaren Wines and Jeff Loomis of Loomis because of their passion for the Rhone region and specifically Hermitage, which is Mount Hermitage behind me on the Rhone River. Last week, we did a deep dive into the Southern Rhone and Chateauneuf du Pape. And this week, we're going to be all about the Northern Rhone. And both of you have a, a large passion for Rhone wines. We talked about the food friendliness. And I'll start with you, Steve as you are determining what varietals you want to grow, how do you pick your vineyard locations or how do you source your fruits? And, and then how do you basically extract from that vineyard block kind of the mental imprint you've had in your head of what you are after based upon all your experience in uh, Hermitage and the Northern Rhone? So it's really a good question, Martin, because what happened was my very first vintage was 2007. And um, I, I was working at Michael Talty's and I was just helping him. And that's when I, he, he said I could make my very first Syrah at his place. And so I ran out the door in Dry Creek and I ran down and I chatted to, um, to George Unti at the time and Unti Vineyards in Dry Creek. And he was good enough to sell me a couple of tons of fruit of Syrah. And that was my very first vintage. Great guys to work with. I love the, They were lovely people to work with. Great farmers, make great wines. But I made my very first wine in 2007 and realized, fucker, I'm not going to be able to make the style of wine I like to drink from California because it's just too damn hot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, you know, I, I was picking it way too early. It was, it was out of balance in terms of what I was looking for. And so then I started realizing I'm going to have to start figuring out how to make, how, how to make a bit more of a Northern California or Northern Rhone style. And I realized that the big difference between the Northern Rhone and California is latitude. We're just a lot further south here than the Northern Rhone. The Northern Rhone, if you look at it on a map, is much, much further north latitude-wise, so they get much less sun. So I started thinking about moving to Oregon and then thought, no, I don't want to go to Oregon. I don't want to go to Washington. How am I going to figure it out in California? And that's when I started realizing I can use the sea fog. Because the sea fog comes into Sonoma Coast, comes into Russian River every single night in the, in the summertime. And it attenuates the amount of sun that the vines get. And so in 2008, I started looking out by the coast. I went into Russian River. Where I lost myself in uh, Russian River, Sonoma Coast, and Bennett Valley. And I've been out there ever since. And so I'm always looking for vineyards where there's a certain fog cover. And just to right. give you an idea, Atusas, which we're drinking tonight or tasting tonight, um, the Atusas is regularly covered in fog in the summertime until yeah. about 11, 11.30 in the morning, every single morning. And so it really only gets to see the afternoon sun. And so what that does is it slows way, way down. It slows the ripening process way down in the vines. So it always becomes one of my last harvests because it takes so long to, to produce or to, to ripen. But it can maintain those higher phenolics that you get typically in the, in the Northern Rhone because you're not baking them out with, with the heat. And so... That was my eureka moment, I guess, uh, back in 2007, 2008. And that's where, I've, that's where I've stayed. The fortunate thing is I'm Scottish and the Scots don't like the heat. And so when I'm covered by fog, just like vines, I'm very happy also. <laughs> the Irish aren't fond of the sun either. I've, I've got all sorts of things that get removed every year that prove that. The, the, the fog aspect is interesting because if the fog wasn't there, you would have a much greater and difficult time, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so you hear the phrase, and Jeff, you can chime in on this first. You sure. hear the phrase cool climate Syrah or cool, cool climate varietals. Yeah. Walk us through what that means from a ripening standpoint. And when people talk about that, what are they specifically pointing towards or, or after? Yeah, what, what's interesting, and, and you know, Steve and I just met too here, but um, I mitigated some of the same issues with fog and hillsides and exposure. So because I'm at elevation and on some fairly steep slopes, I can limit the amount of sun that each of the blocks get. And because I'm on the east side of Atlas Peak, there's actually fog, lakes of fog, I call it, 
at different times throughout the year where they literally settle in and you're fogged in and in, in the valleys between the peaks mm-hmm. and the peaks pop up as islands too. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see up there too. But that that's a consideration too, right? So, so it's interesting that we actually address the same issue uh, in, in, a, in a little different way. Well, and I also like that we, we talk about the word toar yeah, and, and, right. and, and what that specifically means. And it's more than just soil. And you've right. both hit upon certain aspects to it. It's, it's the soil, it's the elevation, it's the microclimates of which there's significant amount uh, in the regions that you are in. Right. And all of that together comprises terrar that impacts the overall output of the product and, and what's going to happen in the bottle. And, and so I think it's interesting are there other varieties that lend itself well to those types of regions? Steve, I'll let you grab that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, where I'm searching for my fruit out in Russian River, Sonoma Coast, I'm typically an island in a sea of pinot. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's, that's what is the prevalent uh, crop out there. That's the money crop. And I mean, in most of the vineyards I'm sourcing my fruit from, um, you know, a lot these vineyards I'm sourcing from, they're relatively big. They're maybe 15 to 20 acres. The vast majority of that vineyard is planted to Pinot. You know, and so there's maybe like a three to five acre plot of Syrah of which, you know, you're kind of keeping the owner saying to the owner every year, it's making great Syrah, keep it, don't transplant it over. Right. Don't, uh, don't graft it over to Pinot. Right. It's doing just wonderfully well here. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the challenge I have. It's a wee bit different probably than Jeff has got over in Napa, but it's the, the same challenge is when you're growing a different fruit in a in a in uh, an Appalachian better known for other varietals, <laughs> you're right. always... <laughs> right. I, I, I you know... The, the, Again, the parcel, the original parcel was 60 acres of which I've, I've got uh, about five and a half acres planted with grapes now. But I walked every foot of that area and found my Petit Hermitage. It's a rock cap on a hillside to where I planted all the Syrah. So, you know, for example, I, have, I grew Grenache Blanc and Grenache Noir and a bunch of other varietals too, Rhone varietals that are in different areas. For example, the the Grenache Blanc would be down in the valley. It'd be at the lower where it's even a little cooler too. The Syrah is planted on a rock cap where the soil is not as uh, as sandy as perhaps some of the other areas. So, um, because Steve will tell you too, you've got to devigor Syrah. I mean, if you just, if you plant it in any kind of fertile soil, it's going to go nuts. And you've got to use the right rootstock. You've got to use... uh, some things too, because you want it to you want it to have a longer, slower growing season, uh, if you can, and that's challenging too. I'm surrounded by cab producers too. I mean, Paul Meyer and Hall are right across the valley from me, the uh, the valley on the on the side of the uh, on the east side of Atlas Peak. So um, everybody's growing cab, but you know, I think when we start talking about climate a little bit, I think Steve and I are going to be suddenly brilliant uh, by accident by uh, predicting climate change. <laughs> Well, and you talked about de vigor. Expand a little bit upon that. Is so, is Syrah one that you know just produces cluster after cluster after cluster? It, or it can it can be a vigorous vine, and it would be a very beautiful vine if you didn't do anything else to it. So you know, in Hermitage, they they do head pruned or boblet styles too, without trellises. You know, I use trellises too, but I I put my Syrah. I have six different clones of Syrah that we grow, and and one of them is an actually Hermitage clone. So, uh, but I put them all in 110R, which tends to devigor the vine um, and, and, and allow it to produce a little better too. And, and the way you prune them and train them and, 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 and tend to them too, all plays into it as well. Well, and then some folks were actually asking earlier a little bit about uh, looking in more detail at these wines and learning about them. I mentioned the Cellar Angels website, by all means, here's the sip kit. This will get you the wines uh, for the next four weeks. Uh, but also you can learn about Jeff's wine here. We're tasting the 2019 Fire Estate Syrah. We'll get into the naming of that. It's it's, yeah. it's, seem, it, well, it's seemingly above, just a shade above a white jug of Syrah <laughs> that he had in Chateauneuf. Uh, and then also Steve was kind enough to feature his 2017 Syrah from the Russian River. And, and Steve, Jeff has the ability, since he owns the land and has planted the vineyards, 
obviously he can control the rootstock. He can control the clone that he wants. You highlighted earlier the challenges that you have because you're working with individual growers. And as if Russian River Valley needs more Pinot, many of them continue to graft over to Pinot. How do you influence them with regards to, hey, this is 18 years old. It's just fine. Don't touch these vines. Let them stay Syrah. How do you fight that battle? I found that compromising photos of the owners helps. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The age old Scottish trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially photos that their, their wives wouldn't want to see or they wouldn't want their wives to see. That, that typically, that nails it every single time. Awesome. So it's a very strong negotiating track. <laughs> It's actually funny though, it's it, the people who grow Syrah, I found, the people that grow Syrah in Russian River are passionate about Syrah. Right, right. They love, they love Syrah. They grow it because they, they love it. Love, yeah. yeah, if they didn't love Syrah, they'd be planting more Pinot. And I mean, it's like, you know, they have to plant, most of these, most of the, the vineyard owners that I'm working with, they, they love Syrah. So they, they know they have to plant Pinot in Russian River because that's, that's what you, you can sell. Right. Right, um, exactly. But they, the they love crop. Syrah. Yeah, they love Syrah. And so they like to have a little block of Syrah so that they can have these kind of little small projects or smaller uh, producers making Syrahs that they can then, they can drink their own Syrah. They can drink wine from their, or Syrah from their own vineyards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's, I, you tend to find that people who love Syrah are very passionate about Syrah. Mm -hmm. yeah. are very faithful to Syrah. Right. It's, it's a difficult grape It's because um, a lot of people ask me about Syrah a lot of times when they come in the tasting room. And it's a, it's a difficult grape because it's not well known. Yeah. Um, it takes a wee bit of getting to know. It's not an easy grape like, and I don't want to say Pinot is an easy grape because um, Pinot has some complex, obviously sure. a lot of complexity yeah. to it. But there's a certain, a certain ease of entry into Pinot. Whereas with Syrah, you can go from a bacon bomb to a berry bomb, mm -hmm. all within the same, you know, within 20 miles of each other. And so it's really, it's, for me, it's that the complexity in Syrah comes from the fact that, as Jeff was saying too, with regards to the areas and his properties, Syrah for me is the grape that is the most transparent in where it's growing. It really shows you in the bottle and its expression, it shows you where it's from. And um, so, I mean, I've got vineyards in the Russian River that are separated by three, four miles. Mm -hmm. Taste those two Syrahs side by side and you feel like they could be from different planets. Mm -hmm. If you bought a couple of Pinots that were three, four miles apart, I'm sure you could tell there's a difference, but are they from different planets? You know, right. they, there's, there's, you know there's, a certain, there's a certain Pinot nature to it, but Syrah can is, I think Syrah really shows you where it's grown the most and that's why i love syrah i mean that's that's what keeps itching my brain all the time in terms of dealing with these guys yeah it's, it's a, just a, a universal food wine as he was saying earlier too it's there's something very special about it it's the it's kind of the granddaddy of grapes right uh you know shiraz was a city in persia and evidently that's where they were from and then they ended up in hermitage you know and shiraz is actually another name for syrah that's used in australia and a few other countries as well so well, and it's interesting too, when we do research for these segments, it, it even marvels us to, to go back as far as some of these places go. And there's vineyards dating back to the 1400s in oh, yeah. and around Hermitage. And mm -hmm. I love that discovery process in the Northern California area where sometimes they clear a section of land and they find some old stakes that have been there since the turn of the century. And you know, there was a vineyard there. Well, right. go back 500 years and make that right. discovery and imagine right. what that would be like. Right. Um, hey, uh, Steve, do you find yourself, and by the way, what are you at case production wise? I don't know if I asked that yet. It depends on the vintage. 2020, I made 100 cases, but normally I'm between, normally I'm between 1,100 and 1,500 cases. Oh, that's great. Okay, so right in that, a little bit bigger, but yeah, very, very manageable. And do you find yourself looking further west towards the coast more? Or are you set with the growers that you have and and making them an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's, not much, there's not much left of the indigenous horse population in Russian River. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, um, the thing for me is I love Saran. I, I love experiment. I love looking for more for different vineyards. The thing, the complexity for me is I, I'm not, I'm not like 
Jeff, where he's very fortunate, he's got a lovely property, he's got a lovely vineyard, he gets to play with it, he gets to, to, to experiment with it, and it's, uh, uh, that's lovely. Um, I'm, I'm working with growers, but the way I work with the growers is a wee bit more special. So it's not every grower that wants to work with me in the sense that the vineyards I work with, um, I have to be able to talk with the vineyard manager and with the vineyard owner and we farm it the way I want to farm it. Right. And so it's very important to me to do that because I feel like the wine, you know, and it's, it's, it's overplayed. A lot of people say the same thing, you know, the wine's made in the vineyard, but it's true. I mean, I think the further upstream you can get um, into the process of growing fruit and how to grow fruit, mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference. And so for me, I don't have my own vineyards, but the way I treat it is I'm almost leasing a certain portion of the property mm -hmm. uh, that's owned by the landowner, the, the vineyard owner, and we're farming it the way that I want to farm it. And so it's not everybody that wants to do that. Some people have one vineyard manager and they farm the whole vineyard the way that they want to farm it. Um, so that's that's the challenge for me. But yeah, for sure, I'm, I, I brought on a new vineyard last year. Uh, I brought on the Gregory Vineyard um, and I'm working with the Duttons out in um, that Sonoma coast. And it's a gorgeous vineyard. I get the Viognier from there. And I've been keeping my eye on the, on the Syrah for the last few years and I love the look of it. And finally, last year, I managed to get uh, access to half a, half an acre of it, and we started uh, we started farming it a little bit differently. And yeah, it's making a fantastic Syrah. Fantastic. So, yeah, I like it. Good. Always on the hunt. I do want to uh, congratulate Jeff and Jane Greasy because they had the correct answer in this week's quiz, which was answer C. And by the way, when I mean there were several other people that had the correct answer, they had the first correct answer. So it's a speed round. <laughs> and uh, the correct answer was there are 130 hectares planted to vine in Hermitage. And what I want to show people is we in the United States aren't very familiar with hectares. So it is just over two acres, two and a half acres or so. And if you look at a soccer field of which we also in the United States aren't very familiar with, so it's a horrible example. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is one acre, and then this is one hectare. So you can see that it is quite a bit bigger than a soccer field, and there's only 130 of these in Hermitage. And so it's, it's a very, very small amount under vines, but it's a very, very special place. And we're going to show a little bit more of exactly how special. When you see from the river looking over to Hermitage, you can see very, very quickly just how magical a valley this is. And, and here we're across the river. Here's Mount Hermitage over here. Uh, there's a very storied chapel up there, which I know Steve and Jeff are familiar with the story of the St. Joseph Chapel. But this is all terraced on both sides of the river. There's not a lot of machine harvesting and equipment that's going up and down these, these rows, if any at all. Um, but this is just a very, very special place from that perspective. And I want to go one step further. There is, you'd think after 84 zooms, I would be able to just go boom, 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 rapid fire down the pictures, but uh, I cannot. So here's a little bit more, and then we're gonna get to some Google Earth. This shows you how wide a swath this is of land. And uh, Steve was talking to us earlier this week about the magic of the bend in this river and how it's, this mountain is perfectly positioned to capture sunlight. And then we're going to get into the growers. But Steve, you've been here a bunch of times. Tell us about this turn in the river and why this land is so special. Well, one of the first things I should point out is I don't have, a, I don't have the, the pointer here, but just down in this little village of Tainon Hermitage is one of the best chocolate factories you'll ever visit. Charlie Wonka <laughs> doesn't live there, but one of the best chocolate factories down there, let me tell you. <laughs> so then when you're in the fact when you're in the chocolate and you come out and you look at that lovely little hill it's the, the nice thing about Hermitage is that it is the it's the only appellation in the northern Rhone that is southern facing uh, yeah. which is lovely right. uh, so it gets a little bit more uh, heat obviously from the, the the thing and it protects it from the northern winds a little bit too and that's very very key because some of the other vineyard, or some of the other appellations further up the the, uh, the river get a little bit more of that northern northern wind coming down. So this one's very very sheltered, 
from the wind and it's too it's kind of far up the valley so it doesn't get so much the mistral that comes up from the mediterranean so it's a wonderful wonderful spot i mean it's just it's yeah it's a special spot i mean it, it's it's nice when you're standing there looking at the, the area and you see the la chapelle it's wonderful well and it's interesting and steve just mentioned the mistral winds and they yeah. are very very famous and we talked about them last year uh, during i think one of our burgundy sections mm -hmm. and these winds are famous and they last a long time. And there's trees that are just bent because they've been in the wind so long. Mm -hmm. And there's statues that depict the wind. It's part of that terroir in that region. And this area is a little bit sheltered from it. I think what Google Earth has done that's so magical is you can grab this little guy and go up on the mountain to a spot and look down. Here's the chapel. Mm. And then you can really take a look and see the terracing mm -hmm. of this beautiful, beautiful spot. That might be the chocolate factory there that looks like a chocolate factory. <laughs> you see the Oompa Loompas, you can see them. I uh, know, see them down. <laughs> they're, they're actually from the Rhone region. Not many people knew that fun factoid. Right. Uh, but, but here's, a, I mean, this gives you an idea. This isn't just flat valley floor fruit. And it, these vines struggle for nutrient and the soil type is extremely diverse with a lot of granite, a lot of rock, a lot of sandstone, a lot of uh, limestone, slate. I mean, just about everything is here. And if you want to turn your cameras on, by all means, you can. Uh, but this is, this just shows you from an elevation standpoint, I mean, there's people walking these roads. You, you are not taking equipment up here. And so it's, it's hand harvested. And I'm gonna show another picture with regards to uh, kind of the soil types, because Jeff has some of this soil on his property. And it's this little picture, which I found fascinating. So here's the chapel that we were just standing below. And this is kind of the, the bottom two thirds of the mountain right here. And if I look at all of the vineyard blocks, it, it looks like a, a voting district in Chicago, uh, but it is not. <laughs> All of these are owned by different individuals, mostly owned by Chapotier. And you will read, you'll see M. Chapotier bottles all over the place. And some are in the middle range, some are lower end, some are very, very pricey. Now, last week we talked about the Rhone being an amazing quality to price ratio from a standpoint of Cote de Rhone, Cote de Ventoux, for the most part, you can find some Chateauneufs. Uh, when you're in Hermitage, that goes out the window for the most part. These are heralded wines. These are some of the most sought after wines in the world. And specifically from this region right in here, Le Hermit. And so now we can drill down and you can even see some of the terracing here. Uh, it lets you know, it's Syrah, Marseille, Roussan, 2.5 hectares owned by Chavez, situated at the top of the hill around the chapel in a place named Ermit. These vines are 80 years old. So that is something that would never occur, unfortunately, in the United States with Syrah, with Cabernet, with Pinot. It occurs with Zinfandel, um, but from an economic yield standpoint, most people don't, they rip the vines out too quickly and they want to get more yields and more clusters because that's more economic viability. Uh, but this is a very, very special plot of land and you'll see some bottles from Hermitage uh, that say Hermit or Steve can pronounce it better than I can. Uh, but this is a very, very special area. But I think an interesting, Jeff, that as you move further right, you get more of the alluvial deposits and more of the sandstone. So here's that clay sandstone, which is predominantly the soil type that you have on your property. Right, right. So, and here's Domaine uh, Chapotier, his property. He's got so much land up here, it's not even funny, but here now you have clay and limestone. And even, and Steve pointed this out as it relates to having wines taste worlds apart when they're three miles away. You have some of that diversity within single blocks here. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be three miles away. You can be three rows away from a standpoint of what your soil type is. And I don't know if you two want to pick on any particular area and see what they're growing there. Um, let me know. But 
Steve, I'll have you talk a little bit about the soil moving left to right because it, it does change and, and what your experience has been in, in price points and, and trying to find something that isn't going to break the bank. Well, first of all, before you could leave that map, if you just go a little bit south of uh, the middle of Hermitage, you see the Cité de Chocolat Valrhona. And that's <laughs> it. That is, that is the place. That's, right next there to it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we found so, actually, it. I've got, I actually brought a little bottle to, I didn't bring it to share because I haven't opened it, but it might be interesting to look for this one on your little pro property here. Let's see. Hermitage wow. La Chapelle, Jaboulé. Uh, so here's, here's La Chapelle. Mm -hmm. Jaboulé. Right up in the corner, right by the chapel. Syrah and majority of granite soil. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's fascinating that we are now, you know, 200 yards away in that in layer meat. Oh, this is within layer meat. So it's kind of like a sub AVA within an AVA, uh, AOC, AOP. And so that's the bottle where Steve has right there. Completely different soil type. Mm -hmm. Syrah and majority of granite. And then over here, you have more of the alluvial stuff and sands and shells, and it's it's not as much stone, all in the same mountain. Right. Well, it tends to go from the northwest to the southeast a little bit in terms of that diagonal. And you're going from, as you mentioned, uh, Martin, from the, the, the granite, the gravel on the, the northwest side. And as you said, it goes down to the stony lower terraces and down into the, the alluvial. And that's, that's the, the, just the gradient as you go across there. And it's really fun to play with the different appellate or the different sub appellations, I guess, within the appellations, uh, or lieu d as they say in France. But it's it's uh, it's wonderful to deal with them because they're so so different. And if you go to some of the bigger houses, like if you go and visit some of the bigger houses down in Tain on Hermitage, and you can actually taste, they will actually take, especially Chapoutier, because uh, he has just so much land across the whole area, and he pulls from so many different uh, portions. That you'll actually be able to taste the difference in Hermitage across the different uh, across the different toil soil types, and it's actually it's it's eye opening in terms of doing it because it's so so huge in terms of differences. No, and you're right. And uh, Chapoutier, I think at last check owned about thirty eight percent of all the vineyard blocks or uh, within uh, Hermitage. So when you see that house's name on a bottle or his name on a bottle rather uh it's usually a very very good bottle of wine when we used to own the wine store it was always fun to to have that on the shelf and hand sell those bottles because they're just special bottles i do want to make a special shout out uh in the studio audience this evening are none other than jeff and jane i can't say their last names but they answered the question right and we flew them down to be in the studio audience ladies and gentlemen <laughs> here in they had to escape the cold weather in chicago when oh by the way it's going to be 38 tomorrow in naples so they didn't do a great job of escaping uh, but this is actually special it's it's warmer uh, i didn't say hello to doug i see doug good to see doug and let's go through jeff talk to us about the the fire and i don't mean the 2017 or 2020 Right. I mean, fire. you want about the wine or the actual fires? The wine. <laughs> the wine. So um, the 2019 fire is actually the wine I set out to make back in the early 2000, 2003. And um, I wanted to make some other wines along the way. I knew that it would take some time to mature. So uh, first planted the first Syrahs, four different clones in 2003. Also planted uh, three clones of Grenache Noir, Movedra, and Cunoa, along with some Grenache Blanc and Viognier as well. And um, until 2019 vintage, we blended it into my Ember. So the Ember is more a Chateau Neuf de Pop blend with Grenache, uh, Grenache Noir, Movedra, Cunoa, and Syrah. But finally, we felt after tasting the Syrah for for many, many years too, that we were ready to make our first single uh, single estate vineyard Syrah. And that is what you have in your hands right now, the 2019 fire. So it's 100% Syrah, six different clones, uh, Hermitage, uh, Cote Roti, uh, three Beaucastels and a Phelps. 
Wow. So, <laughs> you, but other than that. <laughs> are they, are they suitcase clones where you were running from the airport or how, how did you? Well, I, I, it's best to not talk about how the uh, Hermitage and Cote Roti clones were um, ended up in Napa, but um, it, it wasn't conventional. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Excellent. I, yeah. I like it. And so give us a, a, an overview of the flavor profile uh, because it's interesting we talked about age of vines and in, in later meat being 80 years and the average age in Hermitage is over 40. So right. all of us know it's going to be nearly impossible to find 40 year old Syrah vines in Northern California. Exactly. So, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah. Mine are now 17. So okay. we're, we're getting there. So to give you an idea, the Syrah vines were, you know, 14, 15 years old before we actually made this wine. And uh, the idea was to, uh, to get some maturity, to get some, some softness kind of into it to where it's not a tannin bomb either. You know, blackberry, plum, all those wonderful characteristics. And, and for me, most of all, finish. Something that's gonna last on the palate for a bit longer than normal. And uh, the reason that the, uh, the blend is called Ember because that's Little Fire. So that's where that name came from. We, we learned very early on going to the, uh, each vintage one after another that we weren't going to get to a place that I wanted to get to until these vines had time to had time to mature. Wow. And I mentioned that there was vineyards in Hermitage going back 600 years. I forgot to mention that was 600 years B.C. Right. When they found vineyards. That's B.C. is for those of you sipsters know that's before Cellar Angels. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's a long time ago. And allegedly in Persia before that. So it's uh, it, it's nuts. It's nuts how, yeah, long, how old this is. Many people think it's the oldest uh, grape varietal. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, okay, so now, Jeff, you have how many cases of this? 115. 115. All right, Steve, 2017, Atusa's Vineyard, Syrah, 100% Syrah? 100%. 200% Syrahs tonight. This is yep. a special treat. And what are we looking at? Flavor profile, aromas, tastes. Both of these, by the way, so, are leaping from the glass. Okay. So this one for me is one of my uh, cooler climate ones. So this is, uh, Atusas is always one of my later harvests. It's always harvested second half of October. Uh, the wine is only 13.2, 13.3 alcohol, so it's actually mm -hmm. nice and a wee bit lighter. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows that the, the fruit has been hanging on the vines for such an extended period of time, and yet the, the, the alcohol is only 13.2, 13.3. It shows that the, the ripening profile is very, very slow out there. Um, the, the reason, again, for that, or the, the, one of the things I find super attractive in this wine when you, when you nose it, when you taste it, is the floral. The floral basically leaps out of the glass at you. You've got that lovely lavender. You've got the, the, the violet. Um, it reminds me a lot more, not necessarily of an Hermitage. Hermitage is tend to be a wee bit bolder. But this is a wee bit more for me, like a more of a Saint-Joseph. Saint-Joseph's tend to be a wee bit more feminine, a little bit prettier, a little bit more floral. Um, it's got some lovely white pepper to it. Uh, it's got some nice herbaceous notes. You should be picking up a little bit of sage, bay leaf. Um, believe it or not, this wine... Um, it's my go-to at home when we uh, barbecue salmon on the grill. When we're when I'm putting salmon on the grill mm -hmm. and I'm kind of doing with a, like a soy, ginger, garlic kind of uh, sauce on the grill, this is the wine that I use to pair with that because I think it's it's floral enough. It pairs, especially if you, you crust your, your the, the fish, if you crust, crust the salmon with Herbe de Provence, you're going to get a little bit more of that lavender violet coming out and it just pairs just fantastic and it kind of shows against the thing that everybody thinks uh, white wine with fish no syrah with fish i but love that you said that because I, I syrah and salmon is one of my favorite combinations too oh, totally. right Jeff, if nobody ever I think, I think we're brothers from a different we are brothers <laughs> <laughs> we're syrah brothers come on <laughs> well and I, I think you just specifically talked about the versatility of this grape Right. And, you, and you're right. Many, many people would pair a white wine with fish uh, with, or if they're going to go salmon, they're going to go Pinot Noir. Right. And it's you just basically talked about a salmon preparation, which anyone can do without a culinary class. It's soy, yeah. ginger, yeah. honey. You, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. 
Uh, but this wine has that versatility. And I was going to ask you, because both of you talked about how Syrah is just a, an amazing food wine and, sure. and has that versatility. Jeff, what are some of the things that, in addition to salmon, is, is can't miss for the fire? Uh, lamb. I mean, you know, any kind of game meats are always the classic combinations too. One of my favorites, though, are tagines, Moroccan tagines. Um, because they have the spice and they usually have some meat, get lamb usually incorporated in there too. There's a lot of complexity of flavors. And, you know, because there's this depth and complexity in the Syrah, it kind of marries with the depth and complexity of, of a spicy dish. So. Got it. And it's interesting because one of our guests this evening, not the in-studio guests that are being rambunctious, right. uh, but the, but Doug, actually you've met before and tasted with Doug. And he said that when you tasted, you were hoping to get to the fire and he's yes. thrilled that you have finally gotten to the fire. Now everyone is interested in kind of what are the aftermaths of the actual fires? Yeah, so uh, 2020 wasn't a fun year, two fires, but at least it wasn't during a pandemic or anything like that. So, oh wait, it was, that's right. Um, yeah, uh, everything pretty much burned up. Um, fortunately, the, the vineyards are uh, pretty well manicured. I have some sheep and we use, you know, we use some tools as needed too. So the rows are, the rows are pretty clean. So the fire kind of smoldered through in the cover crop, not so much under the vines. I think we lost maybe a hundred vines that we had to replant. But um, the sad thing was the clusters were just, beautiful and we've done a lot of work the previous years to get the spacing right and to get everything right between the cordons and and it was uh it was a sad sight to see unfortunately uh 95 percent of the clusters were uh boiled so while they looked beautiful it tasted like boiled grapes and we had to drop all the fruit so um the good news is as you know vines are about 90 percent probably underneath the surface so um they came back wonderfully actually and we had a, a, a very nice, uh, very nice harvest uh, last year, uh, smaller, this, smaller yield for sure, but, but really high quality fruit. Is this your Hermitage vineyard? That's part of, that's actually, uh, that's Viognier right there. Okay. Yeah. I like the Viognier, Viognier on the left where it's sparse and, and Grenache Blanc on the right, but that there's a couple of different vineyards, but the, the Hermitage is actually just, if you pulled back below that, that's where that would be. Well, I do want to show folks. That's the edge uh, of the rock cap. I wish that was my vineyard. <laughs> no such luck. Right. And unfortunately, uh, in Napa County, you can't trellis. So um, otherwise I would. But uh, you didn't do something that uh, that ambitious. Now, now this you'd, also, is... you'd also need a chocolate factory too, Jim. We need, we, I think that's <laughs> Steve. I think that's what we need. That's next. We need the chocolate factory. It is. Well, <laughs> you you have. Uh, and we'll get to the we'll get to the truffle trees in a second. But yeah. but Steve, this is Steve's location mm -hmm. in right outside of or in, you know outside of Kenwood in Glen Ellen, right? And in Sonoma. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when we zoom right down on Steve's DIY new tasting room, uh, Jeff, who is in our studio audience, and Jane have actually tasted with Steve in the tasting room, and you're doing a complete remodel. Steve, is that what I'm understanding? Uh, pretty much. So am I, Steve. Oh, <laughs> yes. For different reasons, Jeff. For different reasons. <laughs> Completely different reasons. <laughs> so this is a, a another beautiful spot to visit, and it gets to Steve is easier to taste with than than Jeff, and I don't mean that personality wise. I just mean geography wise. <laughs> <laughs> they are both fantastically hospitable, and you will not go thirsty. But when you see where Jeff's spot is across the mountain, across Napa. This is the, the gate to Jeff's property is down here and, and Jeff's vineyard site. And you can see how devastated this has all been from the fire yeah. uh, is over this up over here, over here in back on the back side of Atlas Peak. And then we're going to take a little zoom in around. And you can see the elevation change just from the front gate too. Yeah, the elevation change is something. 
So on top of this mountain where the fire went ripping through, uh, there's not much left except the vineyards. And there was obviously some structures, Jeff's home and some other things here. The pond that is behind Jeff is still there. Yep. Uh, it's very, it very, survived. Hard, very hard to burn water. Right. Although I do believe Cleveland made an attempt one time many years ago. <laughs> right, uh, right. So this area here is, is what surrounded by you're doing something over here what are we doing oh uh, we're planning we're planning uh replanting oak trees but we're doing truffle trees so we're actually so, going to try and grow truffles now if i'm not mistaken chocolate and truffle is pretty damn good so steve's got the chocolate company i've got the truffles yeah I, well, I think, yeah. you know I think, I think if it's successful and if it actually works it's going to be a popular spot there's truffles <laughs> and syrah and chocolate i think we're going to have a good time well, more that's what i'm talking need. about what more do you need? That's it. You That's it. <laughs> if I could you just put it. some salmon in my pond, it would be set. <laughs> yeah, that might be that might be a tall order. <laughs> what is the turnaround time on truffle trees before you get six or truffle? seven? Six or seven years. So I had I had uh, um, a parcel planted that were about three years old. So now it's back to starting all over again. So we're in year right. we're in year one now. And so this is literally days after the fire, because I think it was like October 15th or 17th or something like that. And this oh. is 1022. So these are just scorched grapes. And that yeah. was in 2020. So in 2021, most of this all came back a little Absolutely. bit thinner. That's yes. outstanding. Yep. Exactly. And then you're rebuilding some of the structures. So you can great. see that up top is the Syrah on the right side to the right and up higher. No, nope, higher. Next one up. Oh. That's that's the Syrah. That's kind of the rock cap area, right there. These, yeah, these two blocks. This, okay. this, yeah, these two blocks down. Now that one up there is the, the one to the left is Grenache, uh, Blanc, and Viognier. But right here we've got Cote Roti, Hermitage, and as you work your way down through the Bocastel clones to the peak to the left. Yeah, I'm impressed. Uh, I'm looking forward to those uh, getting mature. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 yeah they're they're uh, I think 14, 15 years old now. So, can't I apologize? Right. Uh, we'll, we'll edit and, the and, Ohio jokes off. And just so you know, I did not name this wine after these fires. The, the, the name was actually it was in two thousand three. I wanted to name all the wines elemental things, and originally it was the rosé was air, the white was snow, and the red was going to be fire. So, you, um, you know, I didn't Jeff, mean to manifest fires. I didn't, maybe I put it out there a little too early, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think the next one's Chocolate Factory, Wealth Accumulation, and some, some other boring, and, and Supreme Health. Right. I have to think about this, because I did call it snow, and in 2010, I did get about a foot of snow up there. Oh, geez. Maybe there's something to that. Hmm. You, you talked about uh, trellis limitations in Napa. Expand on that. I, oh see, boy. I see all sorts of trellising. Oh, boy. Is there anybody from Napa County online? We're okay. Um, they, it, it's challenging. Um, they don't want you planting on slopes, which... Oh, you um, mean, do you mean terracing? I mean, I'm talking about terracing. Yeah, I was talking about okay, terracing. terracing. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, trellis okay. systems aren't a problem. It's terracing that, uh, you know, I would love to, I'd love to um, kind of, uh, I, I was able to get it on some slopes. So there's ways you can work around those things. With, with all the wonderful people at Napa County that really are looking out for the winemakers and trying to help them out to, to fulfill their dreams. But um, yeah, I was able to get through. We're, we're up at elevation, we're on some slopes. Um, probably best I not discuss percentages, but sure, there are, um, there are ways. It's kind of not unlike uh, Steve's uh, uh, Scottish Mafia to uh, work with his farmers to get what he wants. Hey Jeff, I've got well, a couple of photos. I might be able to. I might be able to pass you a couple of photos if it could could come in handy for you. All right, perfect, perfect. I'll any. I'll take anything. <laughs> I must Steve say they've, they've, been, they've been really lovely people. They're after the fire and everything. Everybody in Napa County has been really wonderful after the fires. Good. Well, I do remember it wasn't you that told me this, but there are. You're not allowed to go above a certain slope. Right. right. I think what is it, thirty-five degrees or thirty degrees? Uh, Fifteen. 
15, unless yeah. you're grandfathered in. And some of you over on the Sonoma side know uh, Jackass Hill yep. uh, as an ext extremely steep vineyard location and aptly named because it was named that way be for the person who owned it that said, I'm going to grow wine up there. And someone basically said only a jackass would try to grow wine. Up Martinelli. There. Yeah. Yeah, Martinelli. And, and they do, but you are not allowed to grow on anything greater than a 15 degree slope because of erosion, because of certain other things. Uh, but one genius basically incorporated a lot of land that was flat. So that was zero to help balance yeah. out the stuff that was 40. Uh, and you just have to have a round or, or 50. Right. So <laughs> yeah, the, the beautiful thing is if you, you know, if you are trying to get to 15 and you find an area that's zero and an area that's 30 and an area that's 14.9 and average them, you end up with 14.9% as an average slope for the parcel. Right. The, so, the zero might only have one vine on it, but you have to incorporate it. Right, that. right. Uh, that little tidbit has, unfortunately, doesn't work anymore, but it worked initially when I planted. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Jeff, how would someone come visit and taste with you? Uh, email me. I, I don't have a, I don't have a tasting room too. And obviously I'm rebuilding, but I think, I think, um, yeah, if someone was really interested. We could we could meet there and and do some things too. And I hope to have something something going too. I, uh, by appointment only, um, special people, just as you have on this uh, on this uh, SIP event. Uh, but I, I don't do a lot of public stuff at all. Excellent. And Steve, how does someone get in touch with you or your photographer? Uh, first of all, <laughs> first of all, have to contact the Pope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People decree. A papal decree comes in handy. No, actually, if you visit my website, uh, you can. Uh, I'm only by appointment. Um, I'm. Uh, it's. I do the tastings myself, so it's. I only have a. I'm only able to do a few tastings a day. But uh, if you send me an email or if you go on my website, uh, I promise your email will not go to an Indian call center. It will come directly to me. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And we talked a little bit about uh, some of Jeff's portfolio. Give us what your portfolio consists of. So mostly Syrah, as uh, surprise, surprise. I have um, <laughs> typically, I have about, on a yearly basis, I'm making between six and seven different Syrahs. Uh, I also have a Viognier, because um, I do love uh, Viognier from Condrieu. And I'm Condrieu. Oh. Cool climate style of Viognier. Uh, so out in uh, Sonoma Coast, Russian River, I get fruit from out there. And uh, I also make a Pinot because I like Pinot, but my wife loves Pinot. And so it gives me a brownie point every year if I make her a Pinot, so I make her a Pinot. So, so every year you have at least one brownie point to start the year? Is that what you've in your bank account? <laughs> you know, it's amazing how quickly you go through that one brownie point too, Martin. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're no stranger to that, to that scenario. Put her name I, on just, the label. You'll get an extra bounty point. Well, ah. I put a Jeff, I put a dictionary definition on the back of my label because I, I named my Pinot Heather after my wife. Right. And so on the back of the label, I actually put a dictionary de definition for Heather. And the first definition states, uh, um, uh, uh, what was it? a low-growing plant of northern areas. And the second definition is winemaker's wife better half muse problem is still, reverse those you got to reverse those. Still only gives, that's what she said that's exactly what she those. said <laughs> that's why i only get one <laughs> that's why you only get one at least you found out a way to start the year with one uh, i'm yeah. still a novice in that that's that's pretty well, impressive what i what i do find though martin is during harvest i i didn't i actually thought i was banking points this year oh, and no. when i came to harvest i actually wanted to use some and I found that they had an expiration date. I didn't realize brownie points have expiration dates. I didn't they usually last about a day. Yeah. Oh, a day would be good. <laughs> a day, a day would be good, Jeff. <laughs> uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking about marriage relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good topic for me. <laughs> uh, good Bart, stuff. It's time to open that second bottle. Yeah, exactly. It is time to open up that <laughs> second bottle. All right, you so, Heroes of Wine fans and sipsters, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, a deep look in the Hermitage, very, very special place and very, very highly regulated. We didn't get into the conversation about climate change. You've seen some of the other French regions now allow new grapes in as a result. And, 
Hermitage and the Northern Rhone is very, very strict on what you can grow. Uh, there's only two white wines or two white varietals allowed. So it's interesting to, to be keep an eye on that uh, to see what's going to happen because they might have to, as Steve pointed out, I mean, they're much further north than where we are in Napa and Sonoma. So with global warming and climate change and that sort of thing, it's having an impact. Uh, it's going to continue. It'll be interesting to see what happens. You might also see and you heard it here first, there might be some breaking news in the coming weeks and months about the point system used in wine and how that actually might not be on the up and up. So uh, look for that. Uh, I'm not gonna, not gonna share too much of it, but keep your eye on the sake market because it's gonna portend right over to wine. <laughs> That's it for this evening. And I wanna have everyone join in next week because we're gonna do another deep dive to what happens in the vineyard in winter. Uh, because the mustard is starting to bloom all over the valley and winter is slowly coming to an end and it's releasing its long tentacles on these vineyards and the vines are going to start showing a little bit of a rebirth and it couldn't happen at a greater time with three fires and or two fires in three years and uh, we need more vigor we need more production and we need more people like you enjoying these great products thanks for helping us thanks for being seller angels jeff and steve god awesome bless thanks. you both awesome to see you thank Stay you all thank Good you luck. all cheers cheers have a great night. Enjoy. Enjoy. Take care. I'm going to go make some salmon. <laughs>